This podcast is about introducing our fans to the animals, plants, and other products that we work with at Josh's Frogs. It's an opportunity to paint a picture of our hobby that is refreshing. We want you guys to be successful with the animals that you're keeping, and we want our hobby to grow ethically and sustainably into the future. Alrighty, welcome to the next episode of the Josh's Frogs podcast. I'm here with Amelia. We're going to talk about yellow spotted climbing toads. But before we talk about that, just a shout out to Josh's Frogs. Josh's Frogs is the sponsor of this podcast. Uh, we carry everything you need to take care of your reptiles and amphibians from feeder insects to bioactive supplies to heating and lighting and all that kind of stuff. And we can all we can ship it all in one package for you. We have an industry-leading live arrival guarantee um, and tons of blogs, articles, and stuff like that to make sure that you know exactly how to use the supplies to take care of those animals that you love. Uh, so check us out, joshesfrogs.com. Uh, before we start talking about yellow spotted climbing toads, Amelia, tell us a little bit about yourself, like how you came to Josh's Frogs and what do you do here at Josh's Frogs? Um, so I'm a tree frog and toad keeper here at Josh's. I've been here for... Going on two and a half years now in a couple of months. Um, and I had heard about Josh's frogs while I was in college. Um, I was in the MSU Herpetology Club. I went to Michigan State. I um, was actually the president for a couple of years. And uh, Josh's came to do a presentation at my herpetology class I was taking. And then a lot of folks who I was going to school with ended up coming and working here for a time. Heard lots of great things. Um, so I was wanting to get into animal husbandry after I graduated and did some applications to zoos, things like that. Um, very competitive uh, sort of industry to get into, but I was figuring Josh's was also probably an option. I love amphibians, always have, and so I decided to put in here too and eventually got uh, accepted and the rest has been history. So tell us a little bit about a day. Like, what, what, what are the kinds of tasks that you're doing? What are you doing on a daily basis um, as one of the tree frog keepers here? Uh, so it's mostly maintenance of the animals that we have. Um, what we're actually setting up to breed kind of varies on a seasonal basis, an on-demand basis, um, what we need to restock and stuff. But most of it is uh, lots of cleaning, lots of feeding all the animals that we have, checking up on making sure everybody is doing all right. Um, I do tadpole care currently one day a week, so that's a whole lot of um, maintenance plus the water changes, things like that. But um, a lot of it is uh, routine, and then you get to uh, do the breeding projects as um, kind of uh, adds the spice to it, you yep, know? <laughs> yep, yep, cool, cool. Now, tell me a little bit about these yellow-spotted climbing toads. Like, how would you describe them? What's, what's, what's different? Like, physically, what do they look like? How would you describe a yellow-spotted climbing toad to somebody who's like, hey, I don't know what a yellow-spotted climbing toad is versus American toad versus some other frog? Like, how would you describe a yellow-spotted climbing toad? Okay, uh, so they're pretty large toad. Um, they're not very bumpy, but they do have that um, matte, dry kind of skin like you're going to expect from a true toad. They are true toads in the family Buffonidae. Um, they've got some really extreme sexual dimorphism, which makes it really easy to tell which are males and females once they're adults. Um, we've got the two of them here on the log. Um, and the male is the smaller brown one. The female is the large one with the uh, teal coloration and those yellow spots that they're known for. Um, they've got pretty long limbs for a toad um, because they are made for climbing. They're one of the few toads that actually spend significant amount of time in trees. They're arboreal. Um, so they've got those legs that are almost a little bit more like a tree frog so that they can really stretch out and grip all the branches and get themselves through the trees. Um, they are nocturnal like most toads, um, so they'll do a lot of kind of sitting around during the day, but then they come out at night to do all their hunting. That's cool. That's cool. Now, they're more like some of the tree frogs we keep than they are like some of the toads that we keep. Like, can you compare them? Like, how are they like red eyes? How are they like whites? And how are they a little bit different um, from those species? So they're going to be more different from the red-eyed tree frogs. Um, they're nocturnal, like I just said, but they're not necessarily sleeping throughout the whole day like a red eye um red eyes kind of they just suction them cup <laughs> themselves onto a leaf the glass whatever and then they just stay put until the lights go off um these guys do tend to be awake and alert um to some extent throughout the day they just don't really show a lot of activity like that um 
Skin's dry, like I said. Um, they don't have that stickiness. They don't have the sticky pads like a tree frog, so they just kind of have to rely on their grip strength to climb around in the branches. Um, I'm sure they probably wish they had the little sticky toes, <laughs> but um, they do have pretty impressive grip strength. Um, when you pick them up, you can feel it when they're trying to hold on to you. Um, and uh, they don't need quite as much humidity, quite as much moisture as a tree frog because they don't lose as much moisture through their skin since they've got that drier skin. Um, the babies, like this little fella here, are more susceptible to drying out, so we do keep them a little bit more moist, a little bit more sealed off than the adults. Um, but uh, they're actually not too terribly different from the white tree frogs, actually, in terms of care. Um, set them up pretty similarly. I'd probably give them a little bit more of a... Um, uh, width to the tank, maybe not quite as high, but a little bit more width. Um, and uh, you can be kind of flexible with your proportions, I think, in terms of housing these guys. So they they can climb, yep. and like typically that's true of a lot of tree frogs, like red eyes and whites, that spend a lot of their time up on the top. Like, what percentage of their time would you say that these yellow spotted climbing toads are actually climbing? How much of the time are they on the actual ground? Is it is it different than what whites and red eyes are in that regard? That's a great question. I don't know if I really have an answer for that one. Um, we have them in uh, fairly simple setups just for um, ease of care here at the facility. Um, they've got their chunks of cork and uh, different individuals will kind of show a different preference for how much time they spend actually climbing up in the cork versus sitting on the ground. Um, that female there, she really likes her cork piece. This actually came from her enclosure. Um, and she'll spend a decent amount of time sitting inside the tube and, or on top of it versus um, out on the floor, um, whereas the males don't spend as much time, I think, as she does on the cork. Oh, cool. But I haven't gotten to spend a whole night observing them, so <laughs> it's totally possible there's a lot about their behavior that we just haven't really gotten to observe, and cool. sometime we should uh, really put a camera up and check it out and see what they do. Cool. Talk about a little bit about feeding. What are, what are we feeding these guys? What are the options for, for feeding these guys? What are, what are the kinds of uh, insects that they like to eat? Um, so the diet's primarily crickets here at Josh's. Um, again, that's a lot of it's for um, the ease of uh, working on a really large scale with a lot of animals. Um, we feed these guys our largest crickets for the most part, dust them in the Rapashi Calcium Plus supplement every time. Um, like uh, most frogs, kind of rule of thumb, you want to go for a feeder object that is somewhat like um, the space between their eyes, mm. um, the width between their eyes, the... Uh, length of the insect is usually what you want to go for. Obviously, you can have some exceptions for things like night crawlers and hornworms, things like that that are really long. Um, and uh, <clears throat> give them about like uh, five to ten crickets to go and hunt down two or three times a week. Um, babies are getting fed a lot smaller food, obviously. Um, one the size of the little fella in the cup there. It's getting like eighth inch, quarter inch crickets. Again, about three times a week. Um, the babies are a lot more voracious than the adults, and they actually seem to have kind of different uh, feeding habits, which is really interesting to watch. Um, they're a lot more ready to eat as soon as you throw food at them. Um, they'll go hunting it down right in front of your eyes, don't seem to be shy about being watched. Um, so they're a lot of fun to uh, see them eat, whereas once they hit maturity, they... Um, become a lot more uh, reserved about it. They usually wait until it's nightfall, lights are out, nobody's around to eat. Um, so uh, as far as watching the, uh, the feeding experience, um, I guess enjoy it while you can. If you've got a youngster you get from us or something like that. Um, so for the adults, definitely do recommend feeding them as late in your day as possible so that they're getting those feeder insects um, fresh, fully dusted, fully gut loaded, all that. Um, and they do uh, pedal luring, which is when their little toes start tapping and excitement and stuff. It's supposed to help um, kind of stir up insects for them to eat since they do hunt by movement. And uh, again, the babies are a lot more enthusiastic with that most of the time. It's very cute. Um, you can give them different uh, insects um, in rotation of the diet, like um, 
Doobia roaches are another one that you can use a lot, almost a staple. Um, you can throw in things like uh, hornworms, waxworms, butterworms, silkworms. Um, uh, individual animals are probably going to have different preferences as far as what kinds of um, supplementary uh, insects they're willing to take. It's very key to remember to feed them like right before lights uh, turn off just yep. to, to keep the crickets from cleaning off that dust. Uh, yep, when that's another thing that um, applies to pretty much all of our tree frogs, especially things like our red eyes or black eyes that are just extremely nocturnal. Um, there's no point in feeding them during the day because those crickets are going to clean themselves off. They're going to hide. You want to do it right before you go to bed. Yeah. Wise, wise. All right. Talk a little bit about breeding these guys. How do you, how do you breed them? What's the tadpole care? Walk us through breeding these. How do you, how do you know when to breed them? All that kind of stuff. Talk about breeding. Um, so I admittedly got very lucky. I got them to reproduce on my very first time trying to breed this species. Fingers crossed it's that easy every time. Um, the female will actually make it pretty obvious when she is ready to mate, which is really convenient. Um, you'll start to see a lot of increased activity level, lots of pacing and roaming around, climbing around the enclosure. They can actually kind of getting a bit get a bit of nose rub sometimes from that, um, just trying to get out and find a mate. Um, so when we saw that behavior from the uh, female that produced uh, these babies here, who's trying to hunt a cricket that is way too large for him right now, um, <laughs> uh, plopped her into a rain chamber, which was kind of the standard like rain bar setup that we use for um, all of our stuff in the tree frog and toad department. Um, with a couple of males, and she produced pretty quickly. And like uh, most toads, um, like all toads probably, um, these guys lay their eggs in really long strands. They don't lay like a floating mass or anything, just loose eggs like uh, a lot of true frogs. Um, so what was really helpful for encouraging her to lay was um, having root masses in the water that were a really good texture for those egg strands to kind of wrap around, not glue on top of each other, be anchored down. Um, so uh, this is a spathophyllum, also known as the peace lily. And I had a couple of really large, well-established plants of those that I put down in the water and... Um, female really enjoyed having those to lay her eggs in. And those work really well for a lot of the frog species that we breed that are um, laying their eggs down in the water. I've had like reed frogs and um, uh, <clears throat> hourglass frogs, things like that also really enjoy laying their eggs in the spathophyllum roots before. A lot of people don't realize that, but I mean, you can literally take all the dirt off of the, the roots of mm -hmm. the spathophyllum, put it right in the water, and it'll grow right in the water. I have some setting up in a paludarium. It's a really, really yep. cool and easy way to grow them. Yeah, they're very nice, versatile plants. Love yep. them for that. So they laid eggs. They lay them in these chains or, or, or strings of eggs. Give me an idea of numbers. Like how many, how many eggs is she laying at a given time? Um, so the last clutch that we got... Um, we got around a thousand babies out of the water. Um, there were more than that, more eggs, more tadpoles, of course, but any large breeding animal, large number of uh, offspring you're getting from an animal like a frog, there's going to be some mortality. They're just not all going to be as hardy. Mm -hmm. um, so there was probably like, I don't know, 1,500 ish eggs, something wow. along those lines, give or take a bit. Um, this was a smaller female, a little bit less. Um, well established than uh, the one we've got here. So at whatever point we get around to breeding her, she might be producing more than that even. But wow. um, toads in general tend to produce just a ton of eggs per breeding event. I think that's one of the cool things about toads and one of the reasons I like working with them is that you know in our mission to, to limit the amount of wild caught animals that are coming in, this is a, a species that was coming in from Malaysia in the anywhere from eight to a few dozen in a given year would come in to the country. And, you know, now we, we're in a position as a hobby where we're producing hundreds and hundreds and, and maybe even thousands of these guys um, in a given year. And so that allows us to, to kind of negate the, the need to bring in uh, wild caught animals uh, for the pet trade. So that's really cool that way. Talk a little bit about tadpoles and how do you care for the tadpoles? What are we feeding them? How long does it take to, for them to become uh, frogs? Um. So with the eggs and the tadpoles, it is important to have a lot of water flow, a lot of oxygenation. Um, they tend to lay in like rivers and ponds and things like that out in the wilds where they're getting a lot of 
uh, oxygen. So we we're putting um, a couple of bubblers in the tanks um, even before the eggs hatched so that they were getting a lot of um, all that good stuff. Um, the tadpoles tended to uh, prefer kind of a more vegetarian diet. Um, so we were using a base of our own Josh's Frogs tree frog and tadpole food. Um, some slabs of like rapashi, soil and green. Uh, we make into a gel in a petri dish and cut that up for a lot of our tadpoles that like a little more vegetable matter. Um, boiled spinach leaves, they're enjoying those as well. Um, and uh, they're pretty voracious. We're having to just feed them a couple of times a day, every day until uh, they start morphing out. And then it's kind of a bit of a trickle. Um, weren't quite as much of a... Uh, <clears throat> mass morphing event is something like White's Tree Frogs. There was um, a good couple of week period where everybody was coming out from about, um, <clears throat> I believe it was like July 17th to um, like uh, August 10th this past year, I think was about the range where we were really getting everybody out of the water. Um, wow. And then that was after about a month, six weeks-ish after the eggs had been laid because that was um, early, mid-June. Oh, so pretty quick as a tadpole. But, pretty quick, yeah. But the, that long range of them coming out of the water, which yep. I think in the wild makes sense for them to, to be mm -hmm. able to, to not overwhelm the uh, prey in the area. So a longer uh, right. Yeah, coming out of the water period. Very small tadpoles, very yeah. small uh, toadlets. They're having to eat pretty much just strictly springtails for a while when they were uh, coming out of the water. So we had to make sure that we had all of our springtail cultures really, really well established by that point. And then finally, after a few weeks, they were able to start taking the littlest of uh, fresh pinhead crickets. Give us an idea on size. How small are these toads? I mean, you can see her. She's probably at least four inches long. Mm -hmm. He's probably three, three and a half inches long. How right. big are the babies when they're coming out of the water? Uh, so the babies can fit on my pinky fingernail. They're very <laughs> small. I think like a watermelon seed. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's insane. That's yep. insane. So say someone's buying um, a yellow spotted climbing toad. They're going to set it up in, in an enclosure. How do you guys recommend keeping the babies? And then talk a little bit about adults. Like what, what size terrarium? How, how would you guys set it up? Um... So the babies, we keep them pretty simple here. Um, since they are a little bit more susceptible to drying out, we just have them in the like uh, one twenty-eight ounce um, bin with a uh, paper towel and some sphagnum moss for them to hide out in. Change that out about once, twice a week, um, which you can continue for a little bit after you get them home if you want, but it's kind of boring. Um, <laughs> so you could set them up in something like a five or ten gallon aquarium to start out with. Um, and uh, probably want to partially cover the screen top with some plastic or something to help keep that humidity in for a while. Um, as adults, they're not going to need all that humidity. Too much humidity and too much stagnant air can be a problem for them. Mm -hmm. um, so as adults, you're going to want somewhere between 50 to 70 percent humidity and some airflow. Um, you can do like a Exoterra 18, 18, 24 inch um, enclosure for one to two toads, um, or you can go even bigger. I'm sure they will use mm -hmm. at night yep. all the space you give them. Um, or like a 29 gallon standard uh, aquarium could also work for a toad or two. Um, again, you can go larger if you want, 40 breed or something like that would also work great, I'm sure. Cool, cool. Now, give us a uh kind of a range like what as far as hard to keep like are they the hardest tree frogs to keep or are they some of the easiest like where do they fit on that range comparative to other uh pet frogs like how would you say that they they're harder or easier than some other part, uh pet frogs that people might keep um i'd say probably more on the uh the easy to moderate kind of uh side um they're you know they're less common so most people don't really have practice with them yet mm -hmm. um but I wouldn't say that they're necessarily um, significantly more difficult than like your really common like white tree frogs and anything like that. Um, something that's really important to remember when you've got them on any kind of substrate is um, leaf litter is really beneficial for these guys. They can be a bit prone to impaction if they're eating right on the substrate. So whether or not you decide to go fully bioactive or you've just got something simpler that gets changed out like once a month or something like that, um, definitely recommend putting a nice solid layer of leaf litter over the top of that. 
Um, that goes for most frogs and things, honestly. Um, unless you've got like a Pac-Man frog or whatever that's burrowing all the time. Um, leaf litter is your friend. It's not just a nice decorative option. It's something that is really important for helping to keep your animal comfortable, that it's not getting substrate stuck all over its body all the time, yeah. especially if it's got a real sticky skin, and also then helping to uh, keep it safe, prevent impaction from accidentally swallowing substrate while it's hunting. Cool. Anything else that we should know about yellow spotted climbing toads if we're thinking about getting those as pets? Anything that you would recommend for people to know that we didn't cover? Um, what about handling them? Uh, so they can tolerate a little bit of handling. Um, as always, want to um, put on some powder-free gloves, at least wash your hands really well. Um, they're not super sociable, like they'll tolerate it, like, but they're not going to enjoy it. Definitely more of a hands-off kind of a pet like most frogs. Um, and they might pee on you. That is a thing that is uh, pretty common with toads, and uh, these guys are definitely no exception. I have gotten um, super soakered by uh, especially that female a few times, for sure. <laughs> if you didn't mention it, I was going to mention it. I, I like yeah. the yellow spotted climbing toads as an um, outreach animal. We do school presentations. Yep. And I've had females shoot it probably about 10 feet. Like oh, absolutely. Shoot, yeah, it's shoot, crazy. Shoot it's, it's amazing. They can really get some distance. <laughs> <laughs> so the kids think it's hilarious. Of and course. Yeah, and it's a, it's always a, a, a yep. crowd pleaser yep. when it happens. But I try to shoot it not in into my chest so that I'm soaked and not right. into the crowd. So it's it's a little bit fun. Yeah. Uh, to do that. So <laughs> cool. Well, thanks, Amelia, for sharing a lot about uh, these yellow spotted climbing toads. Yep. Um, and really proud of the success that you've had uh, breeding those and, and what you. that means for the the wild caught trade. So I want to move into a lightning round. Um, feel free to say pass on any of these questions if you're okay. not sure the answer. Um, but just give me the first thing that sh shoots to your um, to your mind. So, all right. If money were no issue, what is your dream pet that you would have at your home? Oh, gosh. Um, well, assuming money were no issue, <laughs> I would have a place with a yard and all that. Um, I think an emu would actually be really cool. Really? I've seen videos of folks who keep <laughs> emus, and they seem like uh, once they're really um, used to you, they're actually um, very playful, very fun to watch. That'd be neat. That's cool. That's cool. That's the first uh, emu that's uh, been mentioned on the, the podcast. All right. Besides Josh's Frogs, what's another brand in the hobby um, that's producing quality products or pro quality animals? Who would you like to give a shout out to? Who's, who's somebody that's doing something good? Um, Mike Novi with Rainforest Junkies. He's got some quality frogs. Um, we've gotten stuff from him to breed within the department before. I have personally bought some animals from him for my own home collection. Um, he's got some really cool stuff, really unique uh, and rare species in his uh, inventory. He's crawling. <laughs> All right, he's finding a better spot. Rude. <laughs> <laughs> All right, first pet. What was the first pet you ever had? A uh, goldfish pretty basic did you win in at a fair no, no um i believe i asked for them for christmas when i was really little okay. um and i got surprised with a fish tank <laughs> that's awesome all right besides the emu and besides yellow spotted climbing toads favorite animal or plant in the whole world what's your favorite oh gosh that i don't know if i have an answer for that one that's really hard <laughs> there's just there's so many they're all good awesome <laughs> all right um what did you want to be when you were a kid uh, a baker. Um, I still really like baking. Um, Interesting. But uh, I'm not a morning person. And the whole having to get up <laughs> at insane hours to start prepping everything yeah. fresh for the day, I couldn't do that. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. If you had an hour of free time, no one's bothering you, what would you do in that hour? Like, what's what's your thing? Hey, if I have time, this is what I want to do. Uh, read, go for a walk, um, especially if the weather's nice. It's yeah. a good time frame to go for a nice little hike. Cool. All right, last question. If you had a bunch of people listening to you and you could tell them anything, what, what is something you would tell them? You have the ear of everybody. What would you say to, to, to people? What would you remind them of? Um, don't take everything too seriously. I uh, definitely did that for too many years mm -hmm. and um, finally starting to break out of that mindset. And uh, it's helped me be a lot happier since then. Cool. Thanks for sharing that, Amelia. Mm -hmm. Um. If you guys watch any of our lives on Facebook, I think you'll see Amelia's uh, face on there. I know she's been a part of some of the content that we're producing as well, too. Yep. So check her out uh, there. Um, but thanks a lot, Amelia, for sharing about Yellow Spotted Climbing Toads. We appreciate it. And uh, I think that's it. So have a great day. We'll take t talk to you guys later.
Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoy this content and want to stay up to date, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us across social media. We always want to bring you the best content, so let us know if you, what you think in the comments. And for all your reptile and amphibian needs, be sure to check us out at joshesfrogs.com. We have an amazing selection. Until next time, stay curious, stay froggy, and keep exploring.